Well, hello. Thank you for coming. I'm Dr. DePaulo. Um, I'm a shoulder and elbow specialist and work with Wright State um, Orthopedics. You came today because you're obviously interested in hearing about shoulder arthritis. And the title of my talk says Clarifying Arthritis. So it's meant to imply that what you might think about shoulder arthritis is not necessarily what is not necessarily the case, perhaps. And uh, so I, I hope to clarify some, maybe some misunderstandings and um, enlighten you a little bit um, about what shoulder arthritis is, what it isn't, um, how treatable it may be, and whether it's something that you, know, you want to be thinking about. No, there we go. Okay, just have to hit the arrow, sorry. So again, I want to talk about misconceptions about shoulder arthritis. I think there's a number of misconceptions out there. Um, the assumption, I think, is that people assume that the shoulder is like other joints, and it really isn't. Um, most people, as they get older, they have friends that have knee or hip arthritis. Everyone knows somebody who's had a hip or a knee replacement, but shoulder arthritis is not the same. And by the end of the talk, you should understand why. Um, also, hopefully you'll understand um, if you actually do have shoulder arthritis or if, or if you don't, where to go for help and what type of help uh, may uh, be available to you and what you can do about arthritis if you do have it. So um, if you look at the pictures up here, you'll see what shoulder pain is, right? When you have shoulder pain, it affects a certain amount of your activities and sleeping is one of them. Everybody, come, when they come in, they complain. They say, I just can't sleep. And say, why is that? Why, why does that bother me? And I think the simple answer is often people lay on their side. They lay on their shoulder. And most people that I've met are pretty particular about how they sleep. So if you're a side sleeper or sleep on your back, it's hard. And you don't realize until you become painful how habitual it is. And so it's really hard for people to change up those habits. I can't just say, well, if it hurts on your left, why don't you roll to your right? It just it doesn't work that well. So... <laughs> So anyway, and sometimes when we get to a point where we do surgery, then you really have no choice, you know, because you have to rest it on the one side or the other. But other activities, you know, these are things that it tells you when there's something wrong. I mean, it's, it's rare that I have to educate somebody on when to come into the office because usually the shoulder's screaming at them saying, okay, there's, there's a problem. So things like reaching up into cabinets, buckling your seatbelt, reaching across your body, combing your hair, right? So a lot of very simple, and I'm hearing some uh-huhs in the back, so that's good. So we're, we're hitting home. But so there's a lot of really low level, so to speak, or activities of daily living, things that we take for granted. You know, I mean, everybody assumes that they can comb their hair or, you know, reach up into the cabinet and grab a glass. Um, those activities, which, are, which we take for granted, are often affected when you have shoulder pain. So um, I use these activities also. So, you know, they, they talk about a medical school, and, and I know there's some students here right now, um, and they tell us that the history and physical tell you about 90% of what you have going on. And I, after practicing now for a couple years, am a firm believer in that. So that'll be one of the first things I'll ask people, and I'll try and listen in to all these various activities that, are, that, are, that may be bothering you if you come into the office. Because even within the activities that you see up on the screen, reaching across your body or carrying a purse or things like that, that may clue me in to a particular type of problem that you might have. So even within, you know, one type of shoulder pain might be different than another. And I'm always listening for those clues and I encourage the, the medical students to remember that because often you can get a diagnosis really quickly just by listening to somebody after, you know, having seen enough people with these particular problems. So. So I want to start by talking about what shoulder arthritis is not. And the reason why I want to do this is because I think there's a misperception that, well, I'm getting older, my shoulder hurts, it must be arthritis. And I even get a lot of primary care doctors who refer me patients who have told the patient that, well, it's probably arthritis. And I think there's a number of reasons why this is the case. One is that we tend to put a lot of stock in radiology reports. So usually the first thing that someone will get when they have pain in one of their joints, like the shoulder, is an x-ray. And what happens is you get an x-ray, the x-ray reading comes back, and maybe you're reading it yourself, maybe your doctor's reading it for you. But it'll often say, 
well, mild arthritis in XYZ part of the joint. Well, it turns out that all of us show certain signs that can be equated to arthritis in our joints. The joint space is narrow slightly over time, but is that really arthritis? Or are those just what we call degenerative changes, normal signs of aging? And, and that's, I think, the misconception because knee and hip arthritis is so much more prevalent than shoulder arthritis, and people just assume, well, it's like the knee or the hip, so I must be getting arthritis in my shoulder, and it makes sense, right? But it turns out it's not, okay? It's really not the case. And the reason is that there's another problem in the shoulder that's much more common as we age than arthritis, and it happens to be rotator cuff problems. So if I took a group of people, say, 40 or older, and I was to, to, to just guess off the top of my head without knowing anything about them, what their problem was if they came to me and said they had shoulder pain, I would guess rotator cuff problems. That can span the spectrum of rotator cuff tendonitis or bursitis. People have heard these terms, I'm sure. Rotator cuff tears. And it's that way because the shoulder is actually made up of a lot of what we call soft tissues. So where we, we typically, you know, our bias is to what we can see and what we can see on x-ray is bones. The shoulder is actually made up of much more muscle, ligament, tendon. And the shoulder's a unique joint in the sense that, that stability is provided by those soft tissues. So if you look at the shoulder joint, you can see a picture of an arthritic shoulder joint up here. What you see is that the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. But it's unique in the sense that the hip joint looks more like a cup. Um, the, 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 the socket portion of the shoulder actually looks more like a saucer. So if you could imagine there was nothing else there, and that literally was all your, uh, your joint, that ball portion of the ball and socket would literally fall right out if you didn't have all of these important soft tissues. So you always have to remember that, that the majority of your shoulder is not this bony structure that we tend to see on x-rays. It's made up of many deeper layers, and I'll show you some pictures on my slide in a minute. So that's important to remember. So it's more likely than not, if you have shoulder pain and you're over the age of 40, you have a rotator cuff issue. And our physical exam and other tests help guide us that way. But I wanted to get that out in the open uh, first off because I think it's a common misperception. It's not just about getting old. Shoulder arthritis um, tends to affect people uniquely. And by that I mean when you have true shoulder arthritis in the ball and socket joint, often you'll get it on both shoulders. So we think there's some genetic component to it. And it's very, very complex because there's a whole host of genes and things that, that code for cartilage. And any you know, slight disruption uh, along the pathway, uh, one way or the other, over the years can cause arthritis. Um, and it usually doesn't hit till much later. Um, it's also not the same for everyone. So there's a couple different kinds of arthritis, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as we, as we move on. But just know that you know, if, if you're just using the term arthritis, that's a very general, broad term. And in my world, you know, we like to drill down and get very specific. So it can be hard to generalize your symptoms with, say, your brother-in-law's symptoms. And because you may have a very different type of arthritis, number one, or it might be in a different location, or it might be a different stage. It's, it can be quite complex, even though the end pathway uh, might be the same, and the end pathway being that the joint is no longer smooth. That's the bottom line. So I talked a little bit about rotator cuff problems. Um, the rotator cuff, and I, I like to use my hands to describe it, but if you think of the shoulder as a ball and socket, this hand being the socket and this hand being the ball, there's four large muscles. There's one that, that sits in the front of the shoulder, and then two, three, four that wrap around. It's called a cuff because it's literally like your shirt sleeve, like a cuff. Except in the body, it doesn't wrap a full 360 degrees. You can see that my shirt sleeve wraps a full 360. This is more about 270 degrees. So approximately three quarters of the, balls, uh, the ball portion of the joint are enveloped by the rotator cuff muscles. You don't see the rotator cuff muscles. They're deep to the bigger muscles that you see on the outside of your shoulder, like the, the deltoids. But you hear about them quite a bit. I'm sure anybody who's watched sports for any duration of time, like baseball especially, you hear about people having rotator cuff problems. Um, it turns out that they're extraordinarily important muscles, though, for stabilizing the shoulder, 
for shoulder strength, and for doing things like elevation, so lifting up to reach into that cabinet. Um, and that a disruption in, any, in the muscles in any particular uh, part of the, the muscle tendon unit can lead to weakness, can lead to pain, can lead to inflammation. But there's a really wide spectrum of problems that you can have with the rotator cuff. So it can span the spectrum from having a completely intact cuff and no tear with just inflammation to large, enormous tears um, and arthritis at the same time. And there's a broad spectrum of types of treatments for that. But again, I told you we're not actually going to talk about that today. Um, that's probably more than one lecture in and of itself. But I just want to make people aware that this is much more common than arthritis. And some of you today who came thinking, well, I have a shoulder problem. It's probably arthritis. I'm going to go learn about that. You might actually have a rotator cuff problem as opposed to a shoulder, uh, as opposed to an arthritis problem. So as you can see, the shoulder is a pretty complex joint. Um, I mentioned a little earlier about how the socket really is more like a saucer than it is a, a cup. I don't know if I have a pointer. Do we have a pointer or no? Oh, it is. Okay. Well, the pointer doesn't seem to be working out. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Hold on. Thought I saw it. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll stand in front, and hopefully I won't mess with the cameraman too much here. But again, ball and socket, what this is is a cutaway of your shoulder joint. So it's essentially open it up. But if we were to slice you this way, and you can see how complicated the shoulder joint is which is one reason why you know, within our orthopedic group, all of us are subspecialists. So all of us have done extra training in our particular field. So I did a whole year studying shoulder and elbow problems and learning how to operate on them and treat them effectively. And it's understandable. I mean, if you look at how complex just the shoulder joint is, you can see how many layers uh, there are from top to bottom. And when we're talking about the rotator cuff muscles, these are those muscles. They're deep to the larger muscles that, that you see. And then there's the bony layer even beneath that. And then to layer on an extra uh, layer of complexity here is the capsule tissue, which is sort of this strong rubber band-like tissue that keeps your shoulder from falling out of the socket. What we're going to talk about with arthritis is really the bearing surface. So it's the ball and the socket. And you can see it better here, which shows the bony anatomy of the shoulder. Um, one of the things I want to touch on with the shoulder is that it's really not one joint. Okay, we use the term shoulder, but it's, it's really speaking about at least four separate joints, um, only two of which tend to be problematic in arthritis. And the two that tend to get arthritic are the ball and socket or glenohumeral joint and what we call the AC joint, which is, which is a short term for acromioclavicular joint. The acromioclavicular joint sits on top of your shoulder. So you can feel it. Everybody here, take their index finger and, and feel that little point. You feel a little point, a little bump. You'll know when that's painful. Uh, one of the biggest complaints I hear from, from women who have arthritis of this joint is when they put their purse over, over this uh, particular area, it's painful. Uh, and that's a sign of AC arthritis. Um, that joint also tends to get arthritic and problematic in, in uh, uh, people who do heavy labor or like to work out a lot, lift weights, things like that. Um, but that's far different than the ball and socket joint, the glenohumeral joint. That presents much, much differently. And you, and you typically can't feel that ball and socket joint. It's much too deep because you have muscle layers like your pectoralis muscle, your deltoid muscle, and then the rotator cuff muscles, which are all superficial to that joint. But, but again, the bottom line with arthritis in general is that it's a bearing problem. So in, in, you know, your mechanic may say your bearing is shot. Well, this is a similar concept, except that we're dealing with living tissues. Cartilage, which normally lines the shoulder joint, um, has a coefficient of friction that's actually better than ice on ice, which I always find fascinating because it just means that, you know, our creator made us in a way that's uh, extraordinarily robust. Um, but it's not to say that we can't have problems with it. And, and when that surface breaks down, um, you know, that smoothness goes away, you end up with a rough surface, and then you start to have problems. So, so again, I, I like to put this out there, but the, 
the normal uh, joint surfaces, the normal cartilage surfaces are extraordinarily smooth. And for most people, they last a lifetime. Uh, why might they not last a lifetime? Well, certainly you could have traumatic injuries, okay? People, you know, people are more and more active these days doing sports. Um, kids playing, you know, football, dislocating shoulders, car accidents. There's a whole host of reasons why someone might injure their shoulder. And if you injure cartilage, the bad news is it doesn't grow back like other tissues. So um, cartilage is similar to, you know, brain cells, uh, neurons in which it has a very low potential to repair itself. There's a certain type of scarring and repair that can happen, but it's not as robust as, say, if you got a cut on your skin um, where it would heal right over and you barely notice it, you know, in a few weeks. Cartilage isn't like that. So once you've lost cartilage, it's really hard to get back. Now, there's, there's techniques with small defects that, that we can do, and, and there's all kinds of research being done right now on uh, learning how to transplant cartilage and grow new cartilage and engineer new tissues. Um, but we're not quite there yet beyond small defects. We're, we're still, I think, in the infancy of biologic treatments. And the treatments that we have that are more tried and true, that are predictable, still go back to, um, in terms of when we get to a point where we might replace a joint, metal and plastic. So, and we'll talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about that at the end. Um, why might someone else have arthritis in the joint? Um, there's a number of systemic arthritis uh, types in the body. So you might have heard of rheumatoid arthritis. That's one of the more common inflammatory arthritis. And inflammatory arthritis is, is a, a large group of diseases. Um, I actually work with the Arthritis Foundation um, and there are over a hundred different types of arthritis. A lot fall into this category of inflammatory arthritis. So you can actually get arthritis if you have gout, psoriasis, uh, rheumatoid conditions. And these are actually far different than the normal, what we would call wear and tear osteoarthritis. And they're different because it's a system-wide problem. It's a body problem. And they're often treated with medications that you take um, by mouth that keep the inflammation under control. In reality, they wind up being your immune system attacking the cartilage in your joint. And patients nowadays with inflammatory arthritis are much luckier than they were even 10, 20 years ago. And the reason for that is that there are a host of medications that we call um, disease-modifying agents that are now available that slow the disease down. So it used to be that if you had rheumatoid arthritis, you probably knew an orthopedic surgeon pretty well. That over time your joints were wearing out fast and you were going to at some point have multiple joint replacements. And it's much less the case now. We actually don't see the rheumatoid arthritis patients in our office as much because you know, the rheumatologists manage these patients really well with medications for a very long time. And some never go on to need the joint replacements. Um, whereas years ago when the joint replacements were first developed, they were actually developed with the rheumatoid patients in mind. So it's really a, an interesting time in, in medicine in general um, because, and I, I think it's only beginning because we're, we're starting to see the fruits of uh, the uh, discoveries in the genome um, and uh, a really a biologic revolution that's, that's taking place. So. And by the way, if anyone wants to stop me in the middle to ask questions, please feel free. Otherwise, I do encourage you to write them down because um, we're going to have a session at the end to ask questions. I think, you know, in, in uh, other times I've done these talks, the questions tend to be the most fruitful uh, part of the discussion because people, you can really ask anything and, and get what you want out of it. Um, and and uh, I'm speaking a bit in general for people, but I'm sure everyone has specific things that they're thinking in terms of how it's relating to them, and I'm completely open to that. So, um, so arthritis literally comes from two words, which mean joint and inflammation. So, you know, it, it's kind of simplistic to say, but in reality, you have to have those two things in order to get arthritis. And it's really a, we talked about inflammatory arthritis, it's your body sort of attacking the joint. Um, with an osteoarthritis, you may have had an injury at one point, or perhaps it may just be genetic where the cartilage is breaking down, but ultimately you're getting inflammation. And this is why medications like 
uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Aleve or ibuprofen, why they actually work. Because if there wasn't this in inflammation component to the arthritis, they wouldn't work. Um, and it's why often when people are sort of starting on that pathway of, of treatment, that's our first line of, of therapy. It's also why treatments like injections work. Because injections are basically a more potent anti-inflammatory. So it's, uh, a lot of people have heard of cortisone and, and may have had cortisone injections for uh, various types of uh, ailments. But uh, cortisone just happens to be a very powerful anti-inflammatory that's a little further up the pathway um, than the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It's a little broader. So the way we like to use them is to be very localized about it. We like to put them right at the source of the inflammation. And we use those, we use those medications um, to help get people relief. Because it's, it's not always that the surface of, their joint, of someone's joint is rough and that's what's bothering them. Because a lot of times, even if you have relatively severe arthritis, you don't necessarily feel that roughness until much later down the road. But what bothers people is pain. People come because they're painful. And so, you know, part of our job is not just to go and operate on people. It's to help you live with whatever it is that you have for as long as humanly possible um, before ever getting to more extreme measures. So, um, and for many people, you can do that for a long, long time before you ever need anything more involved like a surgery. So, um, so this is a picture I thought that people would find interesting. I do a lot of uh, shoulder surgery in general, but I do a lot of arthroscopic surgery. And arthroscopic surgery is when you make small uh, keyhole type incisions, usually a series of three or four incisions. And as a routine, whenever I'm doing arthroscopic surgery on the shoulder, we place the camera into the shoulder. Um, these are side-by-side -side pictures. The left side is a normal joint, okay? So you're looking at what normal cartilage would, would look like. And, you know, I don't, I don't have to tell you too much for you to understand that the picture on the left uh, shows a picture of a very smooth joint, right? Um, the picture on the right is showing a very roughened surface. It almost looks like the surface of the moon if you think about it. But what's happened is that on the left, you're seeing a complete absence of that cartilage. And what you're left with when cartilage is gone, because cartilage is a very thin layer. It's about two to three millimeters in thickness, so it's really not much at all. It's, it kind of blows my mind when I think about it that in a lot of people that lasts their entire lifetime. And when it's working well, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonder of nature. But when it's gone, what happens is that that bone that sits right underneath the cartilage, that hard surface, is exposed. And once you start exposing that, then your body uh, recognizes that as... Uh, as pain and wants to slow you down. Um, so literally when you start seeing bone spurs on people, because a lot of people get fixated on, on bone spurs in their shoulder. Why do I have a bone spur around my joint? It's kind of your body's way of, of saying, hey, slow down, this hurts, and, it's, and, and ultimately trying to lock you up to keep you from, from, from moving. If you think about why you get a callus on your hand, right? You, you might be chopping wood or lifting weights or doing something that, that causes your body to react in a way that produces a, a thickened layer of skin. Well, bone spur is kind of your joint's way of doing that exact same thing. There's an irritation there. And one of my pathology professors uh, had a saying, he said, bone has one trick, and that is to make more bone. So once you've denuded that cartilage layer and it's gone, you're left with bone, and the bone's saying, hey, this hurts, I'm going to make more bone. And, and then you wind up on this pathway of, of creating a, uh, a really misshapen, deformed joint like you saw in the pictures before. I'll, I'll you, uh, operate on the uh, left-hand side. What's that? The left-hand side where it looks good, what was, what was being done So the, um, it was, I don't remember off the top of my head why that particular case. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, why did you operate on the left-hand side? So the, um, whenever we do an arthroscopic, surgery, it's routine to examine the entire shoulder. So there are times when I will put the scope into the shoulder, but the pathology I'm looking for is not necessarily inside the shoulder joint. And there's also, um, people think sometimes that you can see everything on an MRI, and sometimes you can't. So as a, as a uh, habit, as a good practice, I routinely go inside the joint, even though sometimes I'm not working inside the joint. In other words, there's a space called the subacromial space where I might be working, and that's just between the shoulder blade and the rotator cuff tendons. 
And I may be doing, say, a distal clavicle excision, which we'll talk about as a treatment for arthritis, for special, for the AC joint arthritis. In that case, I don't necessarily have to go into the joint, but I always do because sometimes there's overlap in, in symptoms. You may come in and I can tell you have arthritis at that one joint, but your bicep tendon may be bothering you too, and those two live in close proximity. So I want to make sure that you don't have a rotator cuff tear or something else that you're seeing. So you can have a totally normal looking um, joint with regard to the cartilage, but it's those soft tissues like the rotator cuff and, and other issues that, that, may be, uh, that may be disrupted. So there's a whole host of whole host reasons. But anyhow, this, I came back to the x-ray to show you, just to, to give you an idea again when we're talking about bone spurs. And when we say bone spurs, that we, we use the term osteophyte. But again, essentially it's the same thing. But what you're seeing down here, all this is abnormal. That's all your body's way of, of trying to get you to stop moving. And, you know, we're living creatures. We like to move. And, and that's why, you know, we, 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 uh, we come in to, to, to figure out what's wrong. What you can see here is that this space, which is normally a few millimeters thick and normally nice and open, is completely closed down in a shoulder with arthritis. So this shoulder here would look very similar to this. And I don't have enough pictures to show you the bone spurs. I mean, I could, I could show you. This is just one snapshot. And if I'm doing a full exam of the shoulder under arthroscopy, I'm taking multiple pictures. I'll take at least four or six, sometimes more, depending on um, the amount of the joint that I'm looking at. But that gives you an idea of how, I mean, you could just tell that that joint looks angry. That's not a happy joint, you know? And that's not the kind of joint that you want to have, obviously. Um, so I mentioned the, this a little bit before, but it's technically three joints. So you've got what's called the acromioclavicular joint, which is the joint on the top of your shoulder. That's where your collarbone meets your shoulder blade. The glenohumeral joint, which is the ball and socket, and the, the scapulothoracic uh, joint, which is your shoulder blade. There's also a, a joint where your collarbone meets your sternum. And the, the scapulothoracic joint and the sternoclavicular joint are, are sternoclavicular joint, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, um, are probably less involved in uh, shoulder problems than are the other joints. And they're definitely not prone to arthritis. You certainly can get arthritis at the, the sternoclavicular, it's just, just not as common. So for all intents and purposes, we'll be talking about the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint, and the glenohumeral joint, which is the ball and socket. So um, AC joint arthritis, if someone was to come to me and say, Oh, the doctor said I had arthritis in my shoulder. It's most likely that you have arthritis in this particular joint because it's actually much more common than the ball and socket type of arthritis. And again, the reason for that is that this type of arthritis is almost a normal sign of aging, that a lot of us will have signs where this joint will narrow down over the years but not even have pain. So it can be difficult to distinguish whether that's actually part of your problem or whether it's just a normal sign of aging. And what I'll see a lot of times is I'll have people come in with x-rays. They were told they had arthritis. And on their x-ray, sure, sure enough, they had a narrowed joint space down here at the acromioclavicular joint. But when you actually put your hands on them, they're not tender there at all. So you, again, it gets back to this history and physical. You have to really be careful about relating what you see on a piece of paper from your radiology report to what's really going on in your actual body. Because I can figure out whether you have arthritis that's bothering you, that's the cause of your shoulder pain, relatively quickly. And all I have to do is do a couple very simple tests. One of those tests is bring your arm across your body. If you do this and you're really painful at this joint, there's a good chance that you might have arthritis or at least inflammation in, that, in the AC joint. Another one is literally just pressing on it. So it seems kind of low tech, but it is. <laughs> and so we don't need MRIs. We don't need arthrograms. I don't need CAT scans to show me that. But it's amazing how few people will actually have a physical exam sometimes, you know, because people don't necessarily know what to look for. You know, I mean, the, the shoulder joint's complex. It, it, it can be somewhat baffling for someone who's not seeing it every day, just like diabetes and you know, heart problems are out of my league at this point. So, but it, it's, it's a relatively straightforward diagnosis to make, but somebody has to put their hands on you. Somebody has to actually touch you to figure that out. So, 
So treatments. Um, I tell people that AC joint arthritis is, at the same time, the best and worst arthritis to have. All right, so the best of times and worst of times. Charles Dickens, right? It's the worst. I don't have to tell you why. You're painful. You came to me. You know, I, I, I can't put my purse on my shoulder. I can't buckle my seatbelt. Oh, my God, it's keeping me up at night. Well, I don't have to tell you why it's the worst. But why is it the best? Well, it's the best because I've got good treatments for that. And a lot of times, it actually burns itself out on its own. And people are really surprised about that because they think, well, once I have arthritis, geez, aren't I doomed to get a joint replacement? Well, not with this one, all right? And even if you go down that road where we've tried conservative treatments, you've tried time, you try everything, and you get to a point and say, I need something, I need surgery, even if you get to that point, the surgery is relatively straightforward. So that's why it's the best. So it's actually a very rewarding type of problem to treat for people because I know that once I've made that diagnosis, I've got a lot to offer you, all right? And so we start with anti-inflammatories, right? NSAIDs, Aleve, ibuprofen, try that for a little bit. See if we can knock down the inflammation and let it die down on its own. Time, all right? Oftentimes, you wait long enough, it just goes away. And I had a bout of this myself last spring. I don't know why it got inflamed. It may have been something I did at the gym, I, I can't remember. But I just remember thinking, well, yeah, okay, now I know what everybody's talking about here. And it took a, a, a month or two, but then it just went away. Injections. Injections actually work very well for this. Cortisone, we usually use a, a combination of what's called marcaine and cortisone. But the bottom line is that you tend to use one medication that's sort of an instant acting medication. It'll numb it up right away. And the other medications are long acting, which is usually the cortisone. So it'll numb it up. You'll know before you leave the office, hey, we hit the right spot. We're, we're in, in the right joint. And the longer acting medication that hopefully over the next six, eight weeks, it dissipates it. And I've had a number of people where they come in, they have clear joint, AC joint arthritis, you give them the injection, and they don't come back for a full year. And maybe they come back and say, oh, that worked great for a while, but it's kind of back again. And you give them another one, and then it goes away forever. And then there's other people where it doesn't, right? So what if you're one of those people who you're not lucky enough for the, uh, the injection to work or just waiting it out? What, what, what then? What do you do? You know, you've reached the end of your rope. This is killing me. I've got to do something about it. Nothing's working. Well, the surgery for this is actually relatively straightforward, and it's what we call a distal clavicle excision. So it's a long way of saying that we shave about that much bone, about the width of a pen or a pencil, off of the end of your collarbone. And that's it. It's actually a relatively straightforward type procedure. It's a procedure I do arthroscopically. I know my other partners who do this type of procedure, they do it arthroscopically as well. But you don't have to have it arthroscopically. There's other people who do it with a little bigger incision. You know, the advantage in my mind of doing arthroscopically is that I can examine the entire shoulder at the same time. So that was one reason why I might look inside the shoulder joint, and then we go up and do the, the work where we remove that little bit of bone. But literally what it does is that it keeps the end of that shoulder blade from abutting against the end of the collarbone. You know that space is worn down with the bone spurs. You shave it away, just a, a, a thin amount of bone, and then it, it stops that inflammatory process. So you're no longer continuing to get inflamed every time you do something like reach up into the kitchen cupboard. So it's an outpatient type procedure. There's no joint replacement involved. And most people are back in action in about eight weeks or so. So I had a truck driver once who in two weeks was back to driving his truck. I didn't advise that he go back in two weeks, but had to get back to work and felt good and, you know, went along his way. So, but, um, no, it can be a very rewarding uh, type of problem to treat. Glenohumeral arthritis is different. Um, I, what I find interesting about glenohumeral arthritis is that if you have it in one side, unless you had a surgery or a traumatic incident like multiple dislocations, you know, it tends to pop up on the other side. That's not always the case with other forms of arthritis. So um, the people who just out of the blue got garden variety osteoarthritis to the shoulder, you'll often be seeing them for both shoulders. And we know there's some genetic component, but we, we, we can't completely explain it because it's, it's very complicated. But we know that there is within, within uh, uh, patients. Um, it's more difficult to treat than AC joint arthritis. Um, this is one where if it gets to the end of the road, you might be talking about uh, a joint replacement. 
And, um, but it's much more rare, you know. So not as many people. How many people here know someone who's had a shoulder replacement? Was one, two, okay. And we've got about 20 or so people. How many know someone who's had a knee or a hip replacement? A lot more, right? So the majority of the room raised their hand with knee or hip. Um, so it presents a little bit of a conundrum in the sense that not as many people know about it. So if you're going to have something done or you're going to be treated, it's probably harder to find a doctor who actually treats shoulder arthritis commonly because there's just not that much of it out there. You know, the typical orthopedic surgeon will see a lot more knee and hip arthritis than they will shoulder arthritis. The other thing that makes it more challenging is that the shoulder is a very complicated joint. And getting a joint replacement right, technically speaking, uh, is tricky when you're talking about a shoulder. So if you are ever at that point and you do you know, need to get something done for it, you probably do want to see someone who's doing a fair amount of these. You know, it's like anything else. You want to do some, you want to, um, you get good at what you do often. So um, there's not just one type of sh shoulder arthritis as, uh, as we had said, but there's also a special case of shoulder arthritis too. There's a case called rotator cuff arthropathy. And what that means is you have sort of a double whammy. You have torn rotator cuff muscles, but also shoulder arthritis. So your bearing surface is gone, and you've also torn those muscles. And that presents a unique problem, which thankfully in this day and age we now have a, a, a pretty good solution for. And it's a special type of implant that I think I put a picture in after. I'm pretty sure I have one in here, which I'll show you. So. So what do you do? So you come to me and, and you say, oh, my shoulder's killing me. The doctor told me I had arthritis. First we figure out if you do have arthritis, right? We've decided, let's get you some x-rays. We're going to put our hands on you because that's the right thing to do as a doctor. And we figure out, number one, whether you have arthritis. Let's say we've decided that, you, yes, you do have arthritis. Where do we start? Well, often people will have had pain for a couple years, and this has been brewing, and by the time they come in, they're already showing some kind of wear. So it's usually that you don't just, you know, come in to see the doctor right away because some of that wear can be happening without you even knowing it. By the time you get to have symptoms, you may be kind of far along the path already. But that doesn't mean that we have to jump into uh, the, uh, a surgical solution right away. So, we, you know, we start with the anti-inflammatories. We start with the injections. The injections, however, are done differently than they would be done for an AC joint. So when I do injections for an AC joint, they're very targeted at that one specific spot. And it can actually be quite difficult to get into that joint because it's much tighter. With glenohumeral arthritis, I'm obviously going to place the needle in a different location. I'm going to place it where that ball and socket joint is to get the medication exactly where that inflammation is. And that can be very helpful for people. And it can, again, it can last quite a long period of time because those medications, number one, stick around for a while, but also... Sometimes once you've broken that inflammation chain, then your body adapts and you can kind of go back to a normal equilibrium. You know, people think sometimes that once you have arthritis, oh my goodness, I'm doomed. But in reality, if, if you're kind of living at a normal equilibrium with the, the activities that you're doing and being relatively pain-free, sometimes arthritis can, can uh, just flare, right? And, and there may be nothing that's changed about the actual structure of your joint uh, it can just flare because you've all of a sudden gotten the inflammation. The inflammation has all of a sudden gotten out of control. So if we can bring that back to some normalcy for you, then we can still buy you, you know, many more years perhaps before you ever have to go to anything more drastic. All right, so say we've gone beyond that. You know, we've, we've done injections for you. It's just not working. You've kind of reached the end of your rope. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to backtrack. Physical therapy. What about physical therapy? Because a lot of people assume that therapy, you know, well, I've got a problem, should I be doing physical therapy? And while that is true for most of the problems in the shoulder, because most of the problems tend to be rotator cuff problems, and it's my number one go-to uh, treatment when I first see people for most uh, rotator cuff problems, it's not true for arthritis. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, when you have arthritis, 
your body against starts to try and bind up your shoulder. It produces the bone spurs that keep you restricted. And you're going to sense that. You're going you're to feel that. The tissues around the shoulder, the soft tissues like the capsule tissue, also will scar and start to tighten. So the objective of physical therapy would be to loosen those up, but then your body's always going to fight you in trying to get you to bind them up so that you're not moving as much. So you're kind of fighting a losing battle in the way. And I've had a lot of patients who come to me after being, you know, going to a primary care or referred elsewhere, and, and they'll say, yeah, I did therapy, and boy, it just made things worse. Um, so my, my, my typical answer for people is, you know, if therapy makes you feel better, do it. But in most people with true glenohumeral ball and socket arthritis, it tends not to feel so good because you, you're feeling that grinding sensation by the time you've gotten far along in the disease, and it doesn't always help. So I kind of leave it up to the patients. If it's working for you, great. If it's not, don't kill yourself over it because it's not going to ultimately, you know, change a heck of a lot. The only people I've ever seen that have done really well with, with therapy, so to speak, are people who rely on their job um, or who are making their living on motion. So I have one gentleman who was a yoga instructor, and he had some of the worst arthritis I had seen. I mean, similar to what, what uh, that previous picture showed. And he had amazing motion and a terrible-looking x-ray. And I say, I can't believe your motion is so good. And he, then he told me he was a yoga instructor. I said, well, okay, that, that makes some sense now. But he obviously was pushing through, and I don't expect the normal Joe out there to go, you know, do yoga to, to maintain that level of shoulder motion because – you know, this, this was his lifestyle. Another gentleman I had similar circumstance, terrible looking x-rays, but he was a painter. So he was always doing this, always. He couldn't quit working. I mean, he needed to make a living. And so he did it, and it actually kept his motion excellent. So it worked, but he was really just working through pain. And I don't expect everybody to, to have that level of dedication. If you can, great. But otherwise, you know, don't kill yourself. So, um, all right, so picking back up. Say you've exhausted your options. Say we've, we've known you now for a couple of years and we've tried everything and temporized things for a long time and you're just reaching the end of your rope and you know it's time. It's time for a surgery. What next, right? Well, the first rule of thumb is you tell me when it's time for a surgery. I don't tell you because the pain usually has gotten to be bad enough to where you're having trouble doing normal activities. You're, you can't sleep. I mean, all these things, you're having more bad days than good days. And, and, you know, there's not a lot of objective uh, criteria that I would use to say, hey, you really should get this done now, because a lot of people have terrible-looking x-rays, but they don't necessarily have terrible pain. And then there's the opposite. Then there's people who have terrible pain and not-so-bad-looking x-ray. So there's really a lot of subjectivity to this. And... It, it, that, that really comes down to, you know, where you are in the whole process. And we can only know that by talking it over and really figuring it out how this is impacting your lifestyle. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I move on to the rotator cuff arthropathy, I wanted to just show you what this is a typical shoulder replacement. So we've gotten to that point where, you know, you just can't live with this. You can't sleep. You've got arthritis. We have to treat it with a surgery. Um, ultimately, you may be looking at a shoulder replacement. And what a shoulder replacement is simply we're replacing the bearing surfaces with, instead of cartilage, we're repairing, them, we're repairing replacing them excuse me, with uh, metal and plastic. So there's a plastic component that gets cemented into the socket and a metal component that gets placed where the ball formerly was. And the technology nowadays is, is good enough to where most of these, approximately 90% of them, last in the 10 to 15 year range. So that's pretty good. Um, that means that the rest are lasting, you know, even longer. Um, are there options surgically before a replacement? Well, there are, but it's usually for select people. So if you were someone like a younger patient, where I'd be more reticent to putting in an implant in because you're going to have to live with this thing for a long time. Uh, say you were in your 30s and you dislocated your shoulder 20 times and it developed early arthritis. That's a really tough problem. But usually, we'll try and treat that with as many uh, what we call joint preserving type procedures as possible. So that's someone who we might try something experimental like a, a cartilage replacement or uh, a transplant type procedure or an arthroscopy where we can smooth things out for as long as possible. Because obviously, if you know, 
not all of these things are lasting people's lifetimes, you don't want to put them in people who are going to have a really high risk of, uh, of potential failure. So that's really something you have to keep in mind when you're talking joint replacement because once you replace a joint, you can't go back. Yeah. What is a shoulder reversal? So I'm going to get that in my next slide. So hang on tight and we'll talk about that. Anybody have any questions while we're on shoulder replacements? This is an anatomic shoulder replacement. Do you have a question? What do, what do I mean by cartilage replacement? So there are select uh, cases in which you can replace cartilage, but it usually has to do with cartilage lesions that are relatively small. Um, and there's a number of different technologies that are being used today. Some where people are growing cartilage in the lab from your own sample of cartilage. Others where we're uh, using um, what we call a microfracture technique where you're actually drilling small holes into the bone and letting your body grow a type of cartilage called fibrocartilage. So there's a number of different types of strategies with those. There's um, cases where there may be larger defects where you can actually take a fresh cartilage transplant, but none of them is as good as your own cartilage and they're all used basically when we don't have a better solution. So if you're the right age, I mean if you're you know moving up in your 50s, 60s, 70s, then these are good options for you because we know we've got a good reliable track record and oftentimes we can get them to outlast you, which is ideal. But um, the cartilage replacement type options tend to be more for younger patients where we don't have uh, that good of an option. If we had a joint replacement that lasted 60 years for 99% of the people, then we could potentially be comfortable putting them in patients who are much younger. But that's really the crux of the issue because once you start having to revise joint replacements, especially shoulder replacements, they're never quite as good every subsequent surgery that you do. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of soft tissues in the shoulder that you get scarring, which can uh, really affect the function of the joint. So um, this is a reverse total shoulder replacement. And this is that special case where you have not only a loss of cartilage, but a loss of the rotator cuff muscles. And, and this implant has been in the United States about 10 years now. It was FDA approved about, about 10 years ago or so. Um, it was originally developed in, in France. It was developed for this specific case where you have your bearing surface destroyed and also your rotator cuff torn. That particular circumstance presents a unique challenge. And the challenge is that normally your rotator cuff muscles act to envelope the ball and keep it centered in the socket. If those muscles are missing, if they're torn away, then what tends to happen is the larger muscle, the deltoid muscle, when it pulls to lift your arm up, that ball rides up high and it starts abutting against the undersurface of your shoulder blade. And if you put a normal shoulder replacement, an anatomic shoulder replacement in a person without a rotator cuff, that ball would continue to ride up and eventually you'd start to loosen that plastic socket. And the reason why they know this is because it's been tried. And for a long time, orthopedic surgeons didn't have a good solution for this problem. So I feel actually very fortunate to be a shoulder surgeon in this day and age because it's a prosthesis that has afforded us the opportunity to not only treat this problem, but now we've expanded it to other very difficult um, shoulder problems where we didn't have a good solution before. So what this procedure does is it places the ball on the socket and the socket side on the ball. It creates a restraint to that ball riding up. It no longer rides up and it now rotates around the ball instead using the deltoid muscle where the rotator mu cuff muscles were gone and were used before. You essentially eliminate the need to have those rotator cuff muscles to keep the ball centered in the socket. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes, but now I understand that the success rate is not Yeah, it, the success rate is definitely getting better. Um, and I think the, the literature would probably, would probably support what you're saying. But you have to really parse that literature to uh, figure out what you mean by not as good. Because the people that we use this prosthesis for tend to have very difficult problems. And they tend to have no other good answer. 
So sometimes you've reached the end of your, the road and you're, dealing, you're starting from a, a much more difficult position. So it used to be, though, that the dislocation rate used to be higher, although we're seeing now the newer studies, the dislocation rate is, is much closer to the anatomic prosthesis. Um, and I think we're seeing an improvement in the results. But I would agree to you to an extent because we do know that um, some of the longer term data, which there isn't a lot of because it hasn't been around as long as the other implants, we see that over time the functional re results can go down. But again, we tend to use this implant in people who either don't have another good solution, maybe kind of at the end of the rope, um, and maybe much older because we're trying to be safe with it and use it within uh, uh, good guidelines because we know we can't go back. So we know we can't go back to another type of replacement. So you really have to parse the data though because for this particular type of indication which we call rotator cuff arthropathy, it actually works really, really well. But they're starting to use it now. We've used it in other circumstances. Some really bad fractures, um, what we call malunions, a number of different types of circumstances. And we found it actually works best in the people who their joint space is gone and the rotator cuff is gone. So it, it can be different based on your particular problem. Depends. Um, what I tell people is, and this is changing too, it used to be um, people weren't expected to get great motion back. I often counsel people and will tell them that if you can get up to 90 degrees, that's good, and above that is great. Um, but I have to say in personal experience, I, I, I've gotten a lot more people close to full range of motion with this implant. And I think the technology has helped. Our understanding has helped on how to put the implant in to position it correctly so that you can use the, the deltoid muscle better. So I, I tend not to, um, the, 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 the priority should be this. It should be number one, uh, pain relief. And then number two, range of motion and function. So it's hard to guarantee what your ultimate range of motion will be. But sometimes you get an increase in range of motion just because you have pain relief. And then oftentimes you get increase in range of motion just because you know, the implant is helping you to work well. But we can't give guarantees with it. So that's the bottom line. The reverse shoulder? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough circumstance. And it, it, every single one would be different. You know? So you'd have to essentially look at the factors individually because there's a number of reasons why it might not be successful. And you know, sometimes implants fail because of infection. Sometimes they fail because components broke or came loose. Again, a lot of these are, are rare, but they still can happen. Um, there's, a, there's a host of reasons, and you'd really have to know your particular reason why it failed and, and get to the root of that to figure out what might be an option for you. Because sometimes there isn't a good option after the reverse shoulder. And that's why we're very cautious about using it, because we know that once, once you get it put in, you either can only go to a reverse shoulder again where you revise it, or sometimes you have to go back a, a step to what we call a hemiarthroplasty, which is a half of a shoulder replacement, and it may not work as well. So it can be, I'll give you an example. I just did a case recently. I had a woman who was pretty frail, 90-year-old woman, and had a reverse, this exact reverse shoulder done um, somewhere else a few years ago. She said that everything was going fine for almost two years. And about a week before she saw me, she started having really bad shoulder pain. Um, she came into the hospital, and clearly she had a dislocation of her shoulder. But it looked really strange. It wasn't just a dislocation. What she had, actually, was that these, and this was a totally different case, so I don't have good pictures here, but these screws had pulled completely out of her bone. So her bone was so weak that they had eventually pulled out. What was odd, though, was that she had x-rays from uh, another hospitalization that showed that it was pulled out, but the components were still together, and she actually was functioning very well with that, just didn't know it had, it had come out. So in that case, your question is, well, what do you do for her? And what I wound up doing was I went in, and um, I took the, the ball component out because it wasn't in any bone. It wasn't holding anything. Took it out, and my plan was if the socket looked like there was enough bone there, I was going to do a revision to the reverse shoulder again, but I'd probably have to use some bone graft. So sometimes you have to rebuild the bone stock in order to put in a new one. Now, it turned out that her bone was so poor and she had barely any socket there to deal with 
that I converted it to this partial replacement to the to the hemiarthroplasty, so to speak, which is more like, which looks more like this, but without the plastic socket. Okay, um, and I saw her two weeks after surgery, and she's doing wonderfully. She can raise her arm to here, okay, but she's got no pain. Now she doesn't have a normal shoulder. I mean, she's got her her. Um, her shoulder is articulating in, in a different location than it normally should. But she's got no pain and she can lift it up to about 90 degrees and she's relatively low demand lady. I mean, she's not out there pitching for the Reds or anything like that. Um, and she's happy. So there are options, but a lot of it, and this is, you know, this gets back to something that's fundamental about doctoring. It comes down to having that personal understanding between you and the physician, you know, talking to the patient, figuring out what's good for you isn't necessarily good for you. And we have to figure out what you need out of it because I may not be able to offer these guys the same operation I can offer you because they're gonna do something much different with their shoulder than you might, you know? If you gotta mow your lawn and wanna play some golf, you're gonna put a lot less stress on it than you know, these guys might who, you know, who knows what they're doing, playing rugby or football or whatever. So it's just, that's important to figure out and, and that's why it can get confusing for patients. A lot of patients will come in and they'll say, well, my cousin had this, and he said it wasn't nearly like that. Or how come you could do that for him, but you can't do it for me? And it really comes down to figuring out what it is that you're going to do with this. And within my level of uh, knowledge about the tools that I have currently, can we make something work? So, oh, sorry. So what's right for you? And that this really kind of dovetails in with what I just said, that... Arthritis is not the same for everybody. And the treatment for you might be different than you, and it really depends on all these factors up here. Your age, your activity level, what you've already tried, how you developed your arthritis. Um, and that's why there may be so many different types of potential solutions and, and different little nuances that will be important for a guy like me to help figure out. So common misconceptions, we talked a little bit about this already. Um, and hopefully you guys all know by the end of this talk uh, what some of the myths are about arthritis. Um, so is arthritis more common than rotator cuff problems over age 40? Yes or no? Okay, good. All right, well, at least if you remember that one fact. If you remember that fact, then, then you're good. Then you learn something, and all I expect is that you take away at least one thing. Questions? Hopefully I can answer questions because I know they're out there. Pain management, yes. What's primarily nerve pain? Her question is pain management. I mentioned cortisone shots, anti-inflammatories. Um, you're saying it is nerve pain. What is nerve pain? Shoulder pain is nerve pain? Yeah, but, okay. Like, you know, the use of Sure. I have one of those people who has that one of the shoulder shots. Right. And very severe arthritis. And they right. Um, my pain goes all the way down to my elbow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. What she's asking is, what options do you have if you don't want to do surgery for pain? And we do have colleagues that are pain management specialists. There are a number of different types of medications. Um, you know, she mentioned narcotic medications, and I agree. The, the less narcotic medication you can take, the better, because it's a medication that acts mostly on your central nervous system, so it's not really attacking the inflammation, per se. But sometimes... You can't take an anti-inflammatory because you have a kidney problem or some other reason, a stomach problem, you can't take it. Um, in which point, uh, you know, I tend to use injections chronically for a person like yourself or I get one of my colleagues involved because sometimes using multiple lower dose medications, pain medications, 
um, a cocktail, so to speak, can help. But sometimes you get to a point where you just can't cope anymore. And at least from my, uh, from my perspective, and, and again, everybody's case is unique, so it's, it, I'm generalizing. It's hard to really speak to specific cases here. Um, but that's a discussion you have to have between you and the surgeon. And uh, when you're ready is different for everybody. So it's, it's hard to, to speak in generalities about something that's so specific um, because everybody perceives pain differently. I mean, I have some folks who have lived with terrible arthritis for 20 years. I, one gentleman sticks out in my mind specifically who was a farmer who you, I looked at it and just thought, how could you live this long with, you know, with this bad of a joint? And eventually he got a replacement, and it was so bad that, that I mean, it, it just took a lot of extra work to chip away at all that extra bone spur when we actually got down to doing it. But and then I had another gentleman who I operated on him not too long ago, maybe eight or eight, 12 weeks ago. And his arthritis was nowhere near as bad as this gentleman by his x-ray. So it's hard to know, you know. I mean, it's, and that's why we rely on patients to tell us uh, probably we give, you know, we can't give explicit guarantees. I mean, we can tell you a range of what the outcomes are. You know, out of 100 people, X number did this well, or, or there were X number of complications. Um, but we, we, we can't say specifically for your particular case that, yes, you are guaranteed X, Y result. That just, that wouldn't be right. Um, so, yeah, it comes down to a discussion of, you know, between you and your doctor and, and sometimes getting other, other specialists involved if it's a matter of, you know, you were trying to get a certain amount of time out of something. But it's, it's hard to speak in general about specific cases, though. Another question in the back? Um, I guess it just depends. I mean, it depends on your, uh, the question is, if you have mild to moderate pain, um, are there physical therapy exercises that are better than others if you're not sure if you have arthritis versus rotator cuff problems? So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like what you might be getting at is, can you do some exercises and, you know, not exactly knowing what you have? Um, right, what would make it, what would you want to avoid, right? And, and to see, so potentially an exercise might take care of it and then it gets better and, you know, you don't have to worry about taking that next step and going further with that. There, there are a lot of good exercises. Usually they involve strengthening the rotator cuff muscles. And um, we have, I have a host of them that I use. And I've asked some people, you can put your email down or whatever. If you're interested, make a note next to it and I can even send uh, some that I use for people. Um, but they involve mainly strengthening the rotator cuff muscles. There are very few that I prescribe where I would say they might be of damage. I mean, usually those are restrictions I put on people after surgery. Your body often tells you when you're pushing something too far. And the problem with arthritis is that, you know, you get that grinding sensation, and so it, it, your mind tells you to stop moving. You don't want to move. Uh, so I, I usually don't have to write a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, restrictions um, if we're at a point you know, prior to a surgery because, you know, your, your, your body's pretty tough and, and will tell you when there's, a, when there's an issue. And, and most of the ones that we use are relatively gentle, so. Question? That's a good question. Um, is there a guideline to how many cortisone injections you should or should not have? And this is something that I hear all the time. Um, most people will quote the number three, they'll say. My doctor told me I can't get more than three per year. And I've thought about this often because I've looked it up and I've even read some papers that said there's actually no justification for that number three. Um, it's a nice round number. Uh, people like certainty more than they like uncertainty. It's easy for me to tell you, nope, can't do more than three, than to sit here and have this explanation of why can't I have more than three. Um, but I'll tell you why we usually don't give more than three or we give some restriction. Because there is a kernel of truth to not doing too many cortisone injections. And the reason why we'll say you really shouldn't do too many cortisone injections in a short span is because while they're very good for inflammation, they do have side effects. And one of the long-term side effects is that they can weaken your rotator cuff muscles, which obviously has implications. 
So we know that cort corticosteroids in general, if, if you know anybody who's taken them uh, in a pill form, that they can break down your connective tissue. Sometimes I've seen people who've had really papery thin kind of skin. They've been on them for a long time. So the same kind of thing can happen. What, how, how many does it take to break down? It's sort of like asking how many licks does it take to get to the center of Tootsie Pop. We don't know, but it's, we, we use the round number because we know that cortisone can stick around for six to eight weeks. If you kind of you know, add it up, multiply it out, uh, three is a good number. So my general take on it is if people aren't getting better with injections, after a few, two, three, and we still don't know what's going on or you know, what may be the, the problem, I tend to start looking deeper. Now, there are different circumstances, like perhaps the one you mentioned, where you're not ready for a surgery, or maybe you've had a surgery, but you can't fix your rotator cuff, but you're still in a ton of pain. Well, in that case, your rotator cuff might be gone anyway. So I throw those restrictions out the window as long as you're able to tolerate for other reasons. So because they can have side effects like increasing your blood sugar if you're diabetic. So there's other reasons why you may not tolerate them well. But being that they're local, most people do. But anyway, again, to make that point again, there are people who have, say, their rotator cuff muscles are just are gone. We've maybe tried to do surgery and you have an irreparable tear or a circumstance where you're not ready for a more, more um, uh, risky type procedure, then you can use the injections more liberally. You know, then you can use them and say, well, I'm not worried about your rotator cuff degenerating because it's not there. So th that's a little bit more background, and hopefully that makes more sense. Questions? More questions? Question? Oh, no, no question. Yeah. Yes. People can have problems with the shoulder blade as well? Yes. So the question is, can you have problems with your shoulder blade? Um, so your shoulder blade sits in the background. It's sort of like the umpire in the baseball game. You only notice it when he did something wrong. Um, it, it, it acts really as the foundation of your whole upper extremity. And there's multiple muscle connections that help keep your shoulder blade stable. And actually, about a third of your shoulder motion, you elevating your arm comes from your shoulder blade. So that's why there are people who even can have a shoulder fusion where you fuse the ball and socket. You can still get a fair amount of elevation because you're moving through that joint as opposed to your ball and socket joint. But what can go wrong with it? Well, one of the most common things that goes wrong is what we call bursitis. And that tends to happen in people who have a shoulder problem somewhere else. So I get a lot of patients who have problems in the glenohumeral joint or in your rotator cuff that then say, man, it's aching, it's killing me way back here. Because in reality, what's happening is that those, shoulder, those muscles in the shoulder blade are now working overtime to compensate for the pain in another area or what's been lost. Another example is after we do surgery on people. Because there are certain surgeries we do where we have people immobilized. And then again, what's happening is that the shoulder blade muscles, which are again a number of, number of muscles, are picking up the slack. Um, but the good news about shoulder blade problems is that they tend to go, either go away on their own or be treatable with conservative treatments. Um, it's very rare to have to operate on uh, a shoulder blade problem, but there are specific ones. There's one called snapping scapula, which is where you can get a grind um, across your shoulder blade. Um, but, but most of them, you know, y you really can stretch out a long period of time before you ever get to a point where you need surgery. Other questions? Ask them now. No? All the way in the back? Nothing back there? Are there any other medications that would be more effective for the nerve pain? Yeah, I mean, Lyrica, again, I'm not a pain management specialist, but if you have pure nerve pain, Lyrica has been shown to be a good medication. But you'd have to first get a diagnosis, make sure the type of pain you're having is nerve pain. Uh, the question, um, I repeated the question is, is there a type of medication that's better for nerve pain? Um, and there are a host of them, but again, I don't claim to be an expert in that area. So I would first make sure you have a correct diagnosis that, you know, what you think might be nerve pain is actually nerve pain. If it is, 
then personally I would refer you to a specialist like a neurologist or a pain management doctor to talk to them about those things because it's not an area of expertise uh, that, that, uh, that I have. Any other questions from the medical students? Nothing? You guys know it all? All right, good. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, hopefully it was informative. And if you do have questions um, and you didn't want to ask them here, uh, Cindy's taking down emails. I'd be happy to answer anything over email if you'd like. And um, that's all. Thank you.